And the temperatures in Capaquin and Mellory are rising. They may hit 13, 14 degrees in the afternoon. In a second, I'm going to be talking to Dom Richard Purcell. Dom, our father, Richard Purcell, the abbot of Mount Mellory, about the first time in its 190-year history that it's closed for visitors. But there are some good news to report as well. There is some good news to report as well. Firstly, before I go to Father Richard, uh, a couple of texts any idea when the government will be formed, says Angela, who phoned into 051 846 Another texter, uh, a Dungarvan caller, said he heard there was a street party in a housing estate in the town over the weekend. The height of stupidity, if this is true. Joan phoned in to say that interview with uh, Barry and Brenda earlier on would really frighten you. And it's very important people listen to that. A lot of people are reacting to what Patrick O'Donovan had to say. The reason we had him on is he's Minister of Finance, Minister of State at the Finance Department. And we were talking about financial matters. And obviously the issue comes up about going into government people giving out about him, saying why are they not challenged over the nonsense Uh, unchallenged bluster this morning, Sinn Féin got 40% of the vote in Waterford, Fine Gael don't even have a TD here, the Minister is a rabble rouser, the Minister is full of it says another person, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael had a chance, it's time for change the Irish people voted hugely for Sinn Féin, they want to change, not empty promises how dare he politicise it, he is arrogant says this other person Um, Damien, that party failed to help and housing system. Oh my God, he's went over the line, says another texter. Martin McGuinness worked very well to hold the alliance of power in the North. It was Arlene Foster's cash for ash scandal that put an end to the power sharing. Other people saying, will TDs take a cut about this now? And Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael going into government, this is unbelievable, said another texter. As I say, we're going to have Sinn Féin on later in the week. But now we're going to talk to Dom Richard Purcell. Good morning, sir. Uh, Good morning, Damien. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. I suppose you don't want to talk about the upcoming government formation talks, do you? No, I'm, we're a little bit removed from that. <laughs> I go on. Give us, give us your Tuppence worth on it. Everybody else is. <laughs> I know, you're fine. So, so, whatever happens, uh, we, we'll, we'll need a government anyway to, to guide us through the next few months. We will, certainly. Listen, you're the abbot of Mount Mallory. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. And uh, just in case people don't know, the, the term DOM, D-O-M, it's, uh, I suppose, the Cistercian or the, uh, another way of saying father, isn't it? That's right. Well, traditionally in, 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 in the monastery, St. Benedict, who wrote the uh, the rule that we follow, St. Benedict said that the abbot holds the place of Jesus, of Christ, in the community. And because of that, he is given the title Lord and Father. And the the uh, Latin term Dominus, um, it, it means Lord. And so from that, we get the title Dom for the abbot. But the, the, the monks uh, call me Richard. <laughs> Richard, very good. Where are you from yourself, Richard? Uh, originally from Dublin. Okay. Uh, How long have you been a, a monk? Yeah, uh, I went went to uh, went 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 to school in Dublin and uh, university, and then uh, twenty three years ago, I joined the monastery in Ross Gray, and I was there for twenty years, and then three years ago, I was elected here as abbot in Mount Mallory. How many? Uh Members, if that's the correct phrase, does one do the Cistercians have in Mount Mallory? In Mount Mallory today, there's seven of us living here, and uh, there are another three monks. Then uh, one of them is in a nursing home in Waterford, Father Ignatius, in the Little Sisters of the Poor there in Ferrybank, and then another one, Father Augustine, is the chaplain over at the nuns in Glencairn, and then uh, Father Eamon is the Abbot General. He's the head of the whole order, so he lives in Rome, just coming to the end of his 12-year term there. So there are 10 of us in total who belong to the, the community here, but uh, seven living at the monastery. And you're still getting up for, is it seven daily prayers you do from seven, seven four, times a day we four o'clock in the morning? Pray. Yeah, for, we'll get up at four. First prayers are at half past four. And they go on then seven o'clock, half past nine, quarter past twelve, quarter past two, quarter to six and eight o'clock in the evening. The monastery was built, I think, uh, it was started in 1833 or finished in 1833, was it? Started in 1833, yeah. Mm. The the, 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 the Cistercian monks uh, had been in Ireland since the uh, 12th century, 1142. They came to Mellifont and over the following 100 or 150 years, there were about 40 Cistercian monasteries all over Ireland. But then in the 16th century, the time of the Reformation, all the monasteries were suppressed. And so it was then during the, the... time of the penal laws, it wasn't possible for men or women to become monks or nuns in Ireland, so they went to the continent. 
Uh, and many Irishmen uh, went to a monastery in France uh, in a place called Mellory in Brittany. And uh, But because of the anti-clerical laws then in the uh, 19th century in France, the Irish and the English monks were expelled from there in 1831. And they uh, came to Ireland uh, to Cork, uh, all the Irish and the English, and they settled in Kerry, first of all. And the following year, in 1832, they came here to uh, Mount Mallory. Uh, well, it wasn't called Mount Mallory at the time. It, it was it was the, the, the mountainside outside of Cap'n Quinn, and they got a lease in, initially from um, the Keane family and subsequently bought the land. Um, and so they started building the monastery in 1833. And in fact, building went on for 100 years because the church that we have today was only built in 19, finished in the 1930s. I know the even during the war years, uh, the emergency, uh, the First World War and the Second World War, you stayed open. This is the first time that you've you've had to to close the doors effectively in the in the history of the the monastery. Is that right? It is really, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a big, um, fairly important principle of, even though I suppose the monks live a certain, certainly secluded life, you know, to a certain extent or hidden to a certain extent, um, a very important aspect of our of our um, of what a monastery does is that it welcomes people who come to visit, whether they come as guests to stay for a few days on retreat or for a few days rest, or whether it's people who simply come up as visitors for for a day or for an afternoon. And uh, all throughout the year, with the exception of two weeks of Christmas, we would always have guests, you know, who who, come, who stay with us. We also have a, a cafe, a shop, visitor centre, and, and so on, where, where people and of course the church is open throughout the day, and people will be coming all year round to to visit those. But because of the restrictions now, um, for the last two weeks we've been uh, we've been completely closed. Uh, initially, we, 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 the church was still open, even though the shop and cafe and guest house had closed. But we kept the church open. But then, two weeks ago, we had to um, to tighten things because we had a lot of people coming up here, and we didn't want to be, uh, even though we love people to come, we didn't want to, to, to be forcing people to come in contact or creating a place where people would come in contact with others. So um, the advice was that we had to close completely. Yes, and a difficult thing to do because. In times of difficulty, um, people want to say prayers, a lot of people, and light candles. And uh, the report that Owen Dalton did, a lovely report in the Irish Times, talks about the, your quote saying that there was well over a thousand candles lit the last were, weekend yeah, in the, the was, course that of that. Was the, um, mm. the Sunday after St. Patrick's Day, um, uh, just over to, uh, this was the, the, last, uh, I think the last Sunday that we were open. And um, we had... Uh, to Brother Seamus looked after the, the, the candles in the church and on the Sunday morning he put out uh, 14 trays of 100 candles. Uh, so that will tell you 1,400 candles and almost all of them were gone. So there were over 1,300 candles lit in the course of that Sunday. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of people, well over 1,000 people came up here that Sunday afternoon Um even though the government had been encouraging people not to go to places and, and yes. not to congregate. Um, but yes, a lot, a lot, it was, I suppose Mellory is a place where a lot of people from around here, from Waterford yeah. down to Yall, across from Cork, you know, pe- people people come down from Tipperary. So people come from all around uh, to visit Mellory, particularly on a Sunday afternoon. And usually, you know, the shop will be busy, the cafe will be busy, the reception will be busy, and people will be in and out of the church. But because everything else was closed, church was the only place they were going to and certainly though um you know people um i think people realize the importance of of um prayer at this time you know and and, and they're looking for something to give them hope and to, to light candles looking to be able to do something i think a lot of the thing is now people feel quite powerless you know mm. what can we do we have to stay at home we can't 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 go out what can we do to help ourselves in so many different ways they do and Mellory has a, a special place in a lot of people's hearts and I've been there myself I've interviewed some of your compatriots there in the past and there's a there's a serenity there there's a kind of a, a pilgrimage aura to it in some respect from its geographical perspective and the topography of the area just lends itself to it but this idea as well that if you have a loved one in a nursing home or if somebody is unwell or maybe in a a difficult area people like to pray and this idea of going somewhere to to light a candle and say a prayer you can tell them I've been to Mellory I've said a prayer for them so I'd say there's a lot of people that are finding it difficult they 
they'd love to be able to go to Mallory and say a prayer. Um, what would you have to say to them this morning, Tom? Yeah, it, 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 it's like it, it's a very difficult time for, for everybody because of the the uncertainty and so on. Well, the the, the, the big thing I think about um, you know the, 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 this is a situation that we're all in together, and 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 so it's not that the, and everybody is bound by the same restrictions, and um, and the big message uh, like we've just celebrated the Easter ceremony is here and. The, in all the resurrection appearances, when, when, when Jesus appears, you know he, he, he has he's the message. The message is, "Do not be afraid." You know, and, and when he was leaving them at the time of the ascension, he said to the apostles, "I'll be with you, you know, until the end of time." So Jesus is with us in this. God, God is with us in whatever we're going through. It's um, it's very hard to work out why is he asking this of us? Why why do we all have to stay at home? Why why has this happened? There are answers that we won't know. You know about both things, but 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 the thing is, we we do know that in whether it's in the sufferings that individuals go through, or in the broader situation in the country or in the world, you know, God is with us, and as, as Christians anyway, we, we believe that you know that 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 um, God is with us in all these things. So mm. it's it's a trying time, it's a testing time, but also, um, you know, we have to believe, we have to have the hope. That, you know, and we know we will we will get through this, and we will get to the other side of it. And um, you know, listening to some of your your previous uh, speakers this morning, you know, we, we, we realise perhaps it's a time for reassessing and reevaluating the important things in life, and and and, and what. We spend so much time doing many things that, you know, maybe aren't so important. And, and at times like this, we, we come to reassess that what are the really important things. And I know uh, you're live streaming some of the services. We're going to be talking to somebody in a minute about the, the streaming of services, religious services. There is some good news, though. Um, two new monks have joined or are joining the monastery this year. Um, and the former Am's house is going to be converted to a, a hostel. Uh, if and when this crisis is 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 over, uh, tell us a little. Yeah, bit. well, actually, the, 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 that that work has been halted. We were in the middle of it. Um, we very got got some uh, grant aid from Leader and and from the Tomar Trust, and so we were converting a, a, the process of converting a section of the monastery into a hostel for St Declan's Way, which we hope will be opened later this year. And um, the St Declan's Way passes right beside the monastery, so. Um, we will be able to offer, you know, simple accommodation to people who who, who are walking that route. Um, so, and more recently, we, we just got uh, the last week we got the, the change of use planning permission came through because the that section of the monastery was originally designated or had been up to recently used as accommodation for the monks, and now we had to apply for planning permission to change its use. Um, but also, yeah, that the, there are seven of us living here, but uh, we hope to have two new monks joining uh, before the end of the year. Uh, there are always people, you know, who are interested, but um, obviously monastic life isn't suited to everybody. Uh, but we've two, two men who uh, we hope will join us before the end of the year. That's good news. And you're obviously just going to wait until the government announces whatever uh, change in the guidelines regarding restrictions before you decide when you will reopen. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that there, there are seven of us living here. Um, we're doing the cooking for ourselves, the cleaning, uh, so we're we're managing fine to look after ourselves. Um, but we we can't we won't be able to open until um, until it's safe, you know. And and that's as, as as much to protect other people as, as to protect ourselves. Richard, thank you very much for joining us, and to you and your colleagues there, stay safe and mind yourselves. Great. Thanks, Damien, and, and I'd love to speak with you. Lovely to talk to you. Thanks very Thanks. much. Dom Thanks. Richard Purcell there. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, Dom Richard Purcell, or Father Richard Purcell, Abbot of Mount Mellory. And um, there was a, a funeral there recently, Father Columban Heaney. He was the oldest Cistercian monk in Ireland. He spent almost 70 years living a monastic life and uh, an extraordinary funeral. They had a funeral, just seven monks and five undertakers. The funeral was live streamed so the family could see it. And according to Facebook, it had over 7,000 people watching it. We're going to be talking to a man next that if you have had a loved one uh, deceased recently, um, what, 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 what can you do, I suppose, if people can't turn up at the funeral? What can you do to, uh, I suppose, get that message out there so people can, can join in in paying their respects? 
Now I'm going to be talking to Colin Shanahan in a minute. Firstly, a few texts to 083 975. Nice to hear Damien speaking so respectfully to Dom Richard from Mellory. Often the national media debate can be disrespectful to any Catholic or Catholic views. Thank you everyone in WLR for keeping us informed and entertained. Another texter. Fair play to Minister Donovan calling it as it is. Sinn Féin and all the independents have gone missing since the election. Um, Sinn Féin having the bottle for government. Well, we're going to be talking to Sinn Féin later in the week about this. Um, it will be a bad day for Waterford if Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil combine because they'll have a very strong Cork influence. Three of the main ministers will be from that city. Mary is texted in then a text. Uh, why aren't staff from local authorities being redeployed to social welfare and health sections as the councils are not able to provide all the services they need at the time? Uh, good morning, Damien. I saw an English registered car uh, in a Boreen in the county earlier in the weekend. I'm wondering what were they doing here? Another texter texting in about the great work that the frontliners are doing and others talking about airports and that freedom of movement is still going on in many respects. Uh, do you know if the COVID social welfare payment is to be extended beyond the six weeks now that the lockdown has been pushed out further? That's a text in from a lady. Uh, we don't know that yet. We understand that the social welfare department are due to make an announcement on that in the next few days. Colin Shanahan, good morning. Good morning, Damien. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, Digicall Media, is that the name of the company? Uh, yes, Digicall Media Productions or Digicall Photography I'd be known as as well, yes, that's the and, one. And you're based uh, in, uh, do you work at a home, uh, Colin, you do? I do, yeah, but most of my work would be uh, event-based, you know, as in weddings and, and uh, you know, I do a lot in the art scene, I do a lot of weddings, I do a lot of commercial work, so I, I don't, I'm not really a studio-style photographer, it's all yes. kind of location and event-based, you know, so yeah, um, I, I, I work from home, I just have a big office here with all the equipment in where I do all my editing and stuff like that, so yep. Yeah. And are you missing the football with Johnville? Um, yeah, missing the everything. Like playing, <laughs> just playing regularly down, you know, weekly in, in Kingfisher, just a game of ball during the week and then our matches at the weekend, you know, it's just been tough without it, you know, trying to get out to go for a few runs, you know, locally down, 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 down as far as the roundabout on the outer ring road and back and stuff like that and just getting out every couple of days just to, to keep moving, you know. But yeah, it's been tough. It's tough on everyone. I'm, I'm sure everyone is missing, including yourself. Yeah. The idea of... Um business and, and forward planning um, when the, the the crisis happened in the last few weeks tell us about the bookings that you had and then they literally just disappeared overnight Yeah I mean like I said just as I said previously all my work you know be it a wedding be a filming a live show being you know photographing a gig uh, out in a factory uh, making commercial videos whatever the case may be you know it's all location based and you're in constant contact with people so when when the first restrictions came in I think they were around the 13th of March and when the the government announced the schools were closing within 48 hours I had literally probably five six weeks worth of work just disappeared instantly you know everything was shut down nothing was happening events and then as time went on you know I was getting more and more calls um, oh, this event is off, this event is off. And now and now I'm actually at the case where um, weddings and stuff that I've had, so the, my kind of March, April and May weddings were kind of getting postponed instantly because couples knew they weren't going to go ahead um, and reschedule. And then you have couples in kind of June, July and August coming to you looking for backup dates in case they have to um, schedule. So, yeah, I basically, ha- I'm, I'm sh- more or less shut down at the moment um, I've had the bones of 15, 16 weeks worth of work just wiped completely and still the uncertainty of, June's work that the bookings that are in for that you know will they go ahead or won't they nobody actually knows you know we're all kind of in limbo so yeah it's been uh, you know I'm like like thousands of the business it's tough when you're worried about the financial implications you know because I still have outgoings I still have a business to run and stuff like that but with two and three mon- months of no work you, you, you literally have no income coming in to support um, and keep keep things running you know Yeah Father Michael Mullins has a report and a quote in Darren Skelton's uh, article in the News and Star saying he's from the, the parish of Ballybricken said that any way in which a family can mourn a loved one during this difficult time has to be welcomed um, and with that then the idea of filming a funeral ceremony at a social distance obviously making sure everything is done properly um, there is ways of doing that which can help people mourn Absolutely I mean it's you know, the times are changing, you know, if someone had said to you 10 years ago, oh, I'm going to set up a, a full multi-camera rig at a funeral, you know, people would have looked at you like you had 10 heads, but it, 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 it's more and more commonplace. And even pre-coronavirus, it, I've, I've had it, you know, last year, very rarely, but I did have a couple of occasions where 
people who had passed away kind of maybe had lived in Australia or a place like that and a lot of people couldn't travel back so they, they set up this live stream. But since the coronavirus and the restrictions, I mean, literally families can only have five to ten people at a funeral, which is devastating for families because, you know, all they want to do is kind of, you know, pay their last respects to, and, and um, you know, have a ceremony and, and have everybody there. That's what, what an Irish funeral is. But since since the restrictions, you know, they've had to find other ways and live streaming is becoming a thing. It is, you know, there's a couple of factors involved, you know, and broadband access being the main one. But I mean, and to do it properly is the difference between a family kind of feeling like they're there without actually being there or, you know, if, if it's not done properly, we can all live stream off a phone and stuff like that. But to do it properly just gives the family a bit of sense of relief that at least they're, that they're there in some way and they can see what's going on and stuff like that. Yeah, and I presume as well, like families, costs come into it. Uh, if a funeral happens, people associate certain costs with it. Those costs are gone now in the sense that there's no big get together afterwards. So yeah, exactly. some people might feel it's a it's a nice way of spending the money that um, that, that might yeah, be a nice I mean, thing to do. You know, it's, it's, you know, like I said, it's, an, it's not a service that I kind of push out as, as a business plan or anything like that. It's just something in the last couple of weeks I've had people come to me saying, look, is this possible? And I said, it is possible, you know, and... and it, you know, there's the small cost involved, but it, it's peace of mind. Like you said, there's no big fancy do. There's no feeding, you know, doing, you know, get paying caters and stuff like that. And and for families who can't travel to the funeral, you know, to be there is probably invaluable to a lot of people. You know, it's it's um, it's very important. I think that, that that people can do that because you know, if the technology is there, why not make use of it? You know, don't look at it as a, a something that's a bit taboo and say, oh, you can't be filming funerals off cameras at funerals. It's not about that. It's about having letting the people have a connection with their family and, and being there without actually being there, you know. And as I say, the, the company's name is spelled D-I-G-I-C-O-L, is that it? Digical Media Production. Digital yeah, Media, it. if anybody wants to contact you. Colin, to you and your family, uh, stay safe, OK? Yeah, you too, Damien. Thanks for the call. Much appreciated. Talk to you soon. Not at all. Talk to you soon there. Colin Shanahan, uh, Waterford business person who's, I suppose finding ways of trying to make money out of a, a very difficult situation. And also there will be some people that will find that um, very nice thing to do, uh, a bit of solace there for some people. Uh, Pat has phoned into 0518461123 asking, why aren't garages bringing down the price of petrol since the price of oil has gone down? It normally takes a couple of weeks, maybe a week because of the supplies as they have. And my understanding as well, Pat, is that there's been so little petrol and diesel sold over the last few weeks. A lot of suppliers still have the petrol and diesel that they would have bought from the oil suppliers three to four weeks ago. And they would have got that at a, a, a different price as it is now. Um, so that's one of the reasons for that. I've texted in about uh, driving. Um, I'm a new driver to the road. So I'm a learner driver, which means I cannot drive without being accompanied by a full licence. With everything going on, I've not been able to drive my car because I've no instructor with me. My girlfriend has a full licence, but that means that if she comes with me to do the shopping, we have to bring the children. And I'm not comfortable yet to bring them in the car with me driving. So she just has to go off on her own. And my car is just sitting there and I'm paying tax and insurance for nothing really when I can't drive it. I understand that no one is expected to do this. Um, I really, I don't mind paying for the car when I drive it, but I've raised my concern and was told there's nothing in place for us and unfortunately there won't be. Just wondering if you could reach out, please, Damien, and find out if there are many more people in this same situation and could we try to get some help or something in place? So there's a a text in from a caller. So um, it's obviously quite expensive, the tax and insurance and the car is literally just sitting there. So anybody who's a learner driver, um, any experiences, please text us in 083 333 uh, Good morning. Lovely to hear Dom Richard Purcell from Mount Mallory Abbey this morning for a wonderful and uplifting interview. Good morning. All the bottle banks in Dungarvan says this texter are now full and bottles are left everywhere. I've just dropped mine at the Civic Dump free of charge. Come on, people. Don't litter. It's a topic we'll be coming back to later in the week. The idea of fly tipping and littering. And there seems to, anecdotally anyway, have been an increase. We hope to talk to Waterford Council about that in terms of what is happening out on the back roads and the streets of Waterford City, County and South Kilkenny. Uh, Hello to all our listeners abroad, says this texter. And also a text in, the Munster Express is not being published today due to an extended Easter break. 
The next edition is due out next Tuesday. So there's no Monster Express out today, uh, but there is... Um, News and Star out today in Waterford City and County and then the leader and the observer tomorrow in Dungarvan. So please make sure to try and support local journalism. John has texted in. He disagrees about the petrol and diesel. It goes up straight away, says John. <laughs> hey, well done, John. Fair play to you. Good point. A lot of people over the age of 70 texting in, uh, referring to the interview with Brenda and with Barry earlier on. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, I suppose, the initiatives that are taking place with older people and in terms of uh, keeping in touch. Uh, Ray McGrath, good morning. Hi, Damien. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, good. How, how are you keeping yourself? Uh, I'm feeling a bit better. I was sort of down over the weekend a little bit, uh, but... I've just had a conversation, just had a chat, and I feel sort of it does re-energize me, you know, having having that chat. It's, sometimes it tilts the world back to normality. For a yes. Time. A lot yeah. of people would know you as a historian uh, based out in the Cheek Point Faith Leg area and also being involved with the Older People's Council and the, the Call to Chat initiative. Explain this to us, please. What's it about? Well, you know, I, I think it came from the library first promoted with libraries and they were able to operate a service up to four o'clock and we felt that uh, you know a lot of people who do feel lonely and isolated begin to feel it more perhaps in the evening time so the older people's council came along worked with the library and extended the hours of that helpline to 8 p.m so we're on the older people's council uh, has put together a team of about 22, 23 people at this stage. We would like to have two people on, Damien, for each two-hour slot. That's how we're operating. And we're, we're almost there. So we have coverage from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. And then the library staff doing wonderful work. They're on from 9 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock. And we can be reached. All of the volunteers can be reached at the general community call helpline number, which is, I think you would very likely have it there from previous calls anyway, 1-800-250-185. Yes. And also you mentioned other community groups at work. There's the community care helpline also, which can be reached at 051-8716-95. So between us, I I think we're doing a valuable piece of work. And... Are you getting that feeling as well, Ray, that people have enough, hopefully, food and, you know, supplies, but it's that human interaction that's so vital to keep people ticking along at this stage, like you you felt it yourself there over the weekend? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, part of the good news, I think, is that we've had fewer than expected calls, which tells me, you know, something very likely you know that what we've suspected all along is that there is tremendous help coming from family and friends a friend called me yesterday uh, last evening and said go to your back door but open the back door and there was a bottle of jemson sitting on the floor just you know sitting at the doorstep and that's just that's that, that's it's a wonderful feeling of solidarity and community support. And I suppose older people, especially my age group of older people, over 70s, who, 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 who are cocooning, um, we feel, you know, one of the things that encourages me is the knowledge and the deep feeling that younger people are making all sorts of efforts and sometimes sacrifices to keep us safe. Like, that's a wonderful feeling to have, Damien. Yes, it really is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to anybody listening to this? I know uh, a number of older people, over 70 is not old, but a number of people that aren't out, they make it their business um, to call people they may not have spoken to in, in maybe quite a few years, the type of people that you'd send a Christmas card to. Literally, you get their number and pick up the phone. I know my, my mammy in Wicklow did it. She tries to call three people a day. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a wonderful piece of advice. And it's, it's, it's mutually supportive, you know, mutually supportive. Um, there are other things I've, I've been looking at, what kinds of, of, of you know, things I can do um, to, to help me uh, through it. 
And, uh, you know, one friend of mine said to me the other day, garden, garden, garden. That's, that's part of it. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have a garden. Developing new interests. Like I was walking out to the back end of the garden the other day and I, I, I came, you know, I, I saw the plant that I have known for years and years and years. And I said, then I remembered where, where I had got it. It sort of opened the sluice gates of memory for me. And I went back to the borders of Wexford and Carlow where I had, <laughs> no one was looking at the time. I simply plucked it off, off the uh, road, brought it home. And it has wonderful nettle family flower. I, I went home, I, I, I came into the house and looked it up. And for the first time in 15 years, got the name of that plant and got its uses. I can make a soup with it, like I thought was just a nice decorative ground cover of a plant. So those are some of the coping strategies. Just take a, a renewed interest. I think you narrow your focus a little bit, you know, when at, at times like this. And you see things more clearly than you have before. Um, so observation of nature all around us. When we get out into our gardens, I'm looking out over the river now and I see, I see a bird cherry that a friend gave me many, many years ago and it's covered in blossom. Like that's a harbinger of spring. It's, it's, it's a summer to come. It's a vote of confidence in a sense in the future as well. And that's what a garden does for me. Mm. But there are many other things like writing, writing that long put off memoir, um, would be would be what one thing that I'm doing to to uh, it's, it's such a such a valuable time, Damien. You know, it, this is history making. Unfortunately, the way the shape it's taking, but it is history making. And I was just saying to a friend on the phone, jot down the notes because in years to come, you know, Granny or or the great aunt will have made notes of her time, her experiences, her feelings during that awful time, you know, in 2020. Um, so that, Very well said. Lots, lots, lots of things I, I, I think we can do, but we have to make them suit ourselves, really. Yeah. Uh, Ray, to you and your family and everybody in the Older People's Council, I know, I know you do great work uh, to Bernadette and everybody, mind yourself, OK? Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Damien, for this, for, for, you know, putting the word out about it. And also thanks to the people in the library and to the Older People's Council and the other volunteers who, who, who are part of this team. Yes. Very much so. Ray McGrath, mind yourself, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Damien. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Ray McGrath there from Cheek Point uh, about that call to chat initiative. And you get details through the Waterford Council, through Waterford Libraries and on Facebook. Got a text in this morning from Frank. Frank Quinlan has decided to raise much needed funds for a few local charities, going to um, attempt to run 21K, that's a half marathon, for 21 days consecutively up to the 5th of May. And this is around the permitted, within his 2K permitted zone. So he's going to be running a 21K starting today and we'll set up a GoFundMe page. We might have a chat with Frank tomorrow about that. A lot of other people texting in. Uh, Damien, I've seen a big reduction in the price of fuel at some pumps, says this person. Another person says uh, about testing and getting results back from testing. Uh, Good morning. There are so many people working in social welfare, says this texter. Uh, Could you please say a special mention to the staff in social welfare? My niece is working there and is exhausted from what they have to do. Please, can you give them a mention? Sometimes they get overlooked. 100% 100% I agree with you there on that. Uh, Damien, regarding that um, insurance and driving test matter and learner drivers, my son is in the same boat. His driving test was cancelled. He's paying full tax and insurance. He's had his 12 driving lessons. He has to cycle to work as his father is from a different house and cannot accompany him anymore. My son is frontline staff and has no option but to cycle. I think this law should be scrapped temporarily, especially now with so little traffic on the roads, especially if they've undertaken their 12 driving lessons. Let us know what you think, please. 83 975 um, Everyone over 70 is in the same boat regarding car insurance. Uh, Damien, people that are cocooning their cars are not, that are not being used, insurance comp- companies can temporarily cancel their policies until the restrictions are lifted. Another person, I completely agree with that text there. You pay road tax because you're using the road and insurance to cover yourself and others while you drive. It should definitely be frozen when it's not possible. The same should be in place for the insurance instructors to get 
on their learning cars. Uh, next, we are going to be talking to Cloda about the Love Waterford initiative. Tracy has let us know that number again, one 800 250185. That's the call to chat or community helpline. 1 800 250 185. Anna and Kappa Quinn says Ray is completely right. Last week, cocooning, it was hard enough. But talk, talk, talk to friends. We'll get through this. Bobby texts it in to say, wonderful interview with Barry and Brenda earlier on uh, that battled through that invisible disease and came out on the good side of it. Um, now we're going to talk to Cloda Roach. Cloda is owner of Muse, the shop down in Waterford. Uh, Cloda, good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Hey, Tell us about uh, where are you? and the home is Balnanasia. My mum is in Havenwood. That is always a concern, but they're doing a fantastic job out there. So they are. We we'll say uh, say a special brother. hello to her. Uh, hello to her this morning. What's her name? Mary Roach. Beautiful Mary Roach. No, yes. she's she's great. She's doing well, so that's good. And they're doing a fantastic job keeping everybody safe. So that's all that matters. It is all that matters. Yeah, it put things in it puts things in perspective, doesn't it, Cloda? Like uh, businesses are suffering, business owners are suffering, and yet health is wealth. Yeah, and everyone has their lives going on as well and everyone has things going on in their lives. So it is very important. And like, an, as a business owner, you, you try and be positive with your customers as well. And like, we're a small independent shop and like all us independents in Waterford, we have such a loyal following of customers from the day we all opened our shops or cafes or restaurants. And the support of them is phenomenal. Like, And, and even not just physically coming into our businesses and, and even texts and communications we get from them since the day we all close our shops. It's just very uplifting. You know, I, I can't thank them enough, to be honest. But just your your business, as, as many people would know, is Muse, M-U-S-E, on the key in Waterford. Have you have you managed or are you doing any online sales or any sales? or, or uh, We don't have an online presence, but we do have, I, we do a lot from Instagram and Facebook. Our social media is, is strong enough that way, all right. And we do get a kickback and, and from that, which is great. But it's, it's very difficult. You, you can't really, like you're not open for business, so... Everything is down. You know, your income is down. Your outs are still going out. I'm very positive about the reopening of all our businesses, I have to say. And I'm very positive just from the feedback we're getting. And I do think small businesses, I think it's emphasised small businesses more and that there are a lot more small businesses in Waterford than most people maybe realised. And maybe a simple signage on a building is what actually highlighted things as well. But... There's some fantastic businesses in Waterford and like us as small independents, we're very, very supportive of one another. Always have been. And like small shops will always support small shops. I'd love to see 40 new independents open up in Waterford. I'd I'd love the town to be full of independents. I think Mm. that's the heart of every city, to be honest with you. Yeah. It just adds variety, you know. Everyone can go online and buy things and that's grand, but it's all uniform, isn't it? It's where you try to offer something different and... It is, experience. and I know, and, yeah, and I know other retail areas like Tremor and uh, Dungarvan, again, the same thing for, for small independent retail yep. businesses. It's, yep. it's so important. And with that signage and with that message that you were one of the people that started this hashtag Love Waterford campaign and um, basically just putting some signage in the shop. And it, it, it's caught on nicely. And uh, I suppose it just gives a message that we will overcome this, yeah? Well, I think back soon looks a lot better than a big yellow COVID sign in your window as well. It's just, and, and we will be back, you know, and I do think it's very important that that, that is the message, you know, and, and it does instills confidence in your customers as well because no one knows. It's uncharted waters and I suppose everyone came to a stage where we all had to close our doors and never, ever have any of us ever been in this situation. Look, as independents, we barely take holidays, never mind being forced to close for several weeks at a time. So we're trying to find ways of um, like we're very good with communicating with one another and we are trying to find ways of still trying to sell within a, a reasonable way that obviously is very safe for everybody but I mean for me if I have to go into my shop it's only me that's in my shop so that's, that's completely compliant with everything but we're all in this situation of trying to find new ways and just new ideas and things and I, I do think at the end of it we'll you know there'll be new horizons for everybody kind of maybe not not how we would have planned it to be, but better, I think. Hopefully, I think it's. Yeah. A, I think it's people are, are are a bit more kinder, or slowing down is not such a bad thing. Sometimes you need to kind of 
value what you have as well. So yes, and I do, it, I, you know, and we all we all love our businesses, and we certainly don't want. I mean, if our if any of our businesses are, businesses were to close, it's not it's not true. This is how we would want it to happen. You know, so we will do everything in our power to keep our businesses open and, and support each and every one of us as best as we possibly can as well. And if we can get so. you even one sale out of this this morning, how can people contact you? <laughs> <laughs> Through Facebook or Instagram, is it? I'm on Instagram at, at Musings and we do post things. At so, Musings, is um, it? We've, we've only at Musings, M-U-S-D-I-N-G-S. Like okay. we have actually the last few weeks, I think we've all been a bit torn as to what to actually do with our social media because it felt a little bit wrong. Like when people were being let go and unemployment was happening to kind of, you know, you, you don't want to be trying to tell someone by address when, you know, people people's finances are, are, are now tight. But there's a time for everything. And I think it's really only in the last week or so that we've started to kind of just post images up again. And you know what? It's just, and the feedback from my customers, certainly, and I know everyone else's, is they want to see a little bit of niceness as well. I know, like, but there's a time for everything. And, and maybe this is a little bit of time for this situation as well, you know, for for a little bit more kind of interaction with people as regards what we do have in our premises and what we are selling. So it's all very gentle and it's all good. And we try to remain positive. We're all in the same situation. That's the point. That really it is, yeah. It's well, not as if uh, one is out doing the other. It's not. And it's a lovely communication. So that's, And that is the key of it, is that we communicate as well, you know. So we share ideas, which is very, very rewarding. Claudia, to you and your family and your staff and to all your uh, customers, stay safe and mind yourself and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much indeed, Damien. Happy Easter. And happy Easter to all our listeners. Um, Frank has texted in, Frank Ryan, what about the senior hurlers and footballers ringing the older members of Club Dacia? It's not a bad idea, Frank. Uh, he says David Brady is doing it in Mayo. Um, it be a nice idea. We might get on to the GA and ask him about that. I love the Love Water for campaign, but uh, placing stickers in shop windows, don't know if this will be classed as essential work, but love the work that they're doing, says this texter. Jeff is up next. Thank you, everybody, for your texts and comments this morning. I'm sorry if I didn't get round to everything and hope you have a good day. Stay safe.